Hello. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Savannah, and um, I'm so honored to be here tonight uh, hosting this interview. I would like to take a moment to acknowledge where I am coming to you from. Um, I am located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, the Lene Lenape, and the Attawandered peoples. I would also like to acknowledge the beautiful river that runs through our community known as the Dishkanzibi. I also wanna take this moment to share a story. I wanna share this story about my three-year-old. He is actually the first uh, person in his family to carry an indigenous name uh, since before residential schools. And last week, my three-year-old was in, uh, his vehicle, in, his, in a car with his daycare crew. And one of the kids says, look, there's the river. And my daycare provider promptly responded by saying, that's the Thames River. <laughs> my squeaky little three-year-old from the back seat says, that is not the Thames River, that's Dishkanzibi. And beyond me wanting to share this gloating moment of parenting with you, I also want to, to share this moment with you in hopes that whatever land you are on, in whatever community you are in, that we are acknowledging beyond these words what our responsibilities are. And it is the youth and the kids coming up next that need this opportunity to hear about these lands and to understand them. And so I encourage all of you, no matter where you are, to take that moment and this time uh, and use these acknowledgements as a call to action. And again, understand not only the people that were here before you, but the people that are still here. So thank you, everybody. I also would like to give uh, a quick little bit of housekeeping. So we are recording. Uh, this uh, fantastic conversation tonight. Um, it will be available on the WORDS uh, website after. Um, I would also like to give a huge shout out to WordsFest for having us and hosting us. Uh, it's been a wild year of people pivoting to online and Josh and his team have been incredible and they've done a great job pivoting over to this uh, medium. So thank you and um, our hats off to WORDS. This kind of content is extremely important in these times when we're all sitting at home looking for things to do. So thank you, Josh. Um, I would also like to acknowledge um, that tonight's talk is in partnership with Western's anti-racism webinar series. So we are thankful for them as well for providing and ho hosting this conversation. Okay, so here we are. Let's do this. I'm gonna do some quick introductions and then we're gonna, we're gonna jump in. Oh, I am also going to say, that we are using the Q&A function. So if you have Qs and looking for As, we will um, at some point be going through those as well. So that is live as well. Okay, so welcome uh, Iskwe. Um, Iskwe is a creator, a communicator of music and of movement, of pictures, poetry, and prose. A storyteller from Treaty One territory, Iskwe is an absolute force on stage Using an eclectic range of inspirations reflected in her work is what makes Iskwe undoubtedly Iskwe. She is a Juno Award winner. She's been on the long list for the Players Prize and has a long list of amazing collaborators. We hope that we can see her on stage soon. Iskwe, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I would also like to take this moment to introduce another Juno Award winner, local London legend. <laughs> Sarah Legault. Sarah is a director, a filmmaker, a producer, an animator, a builder, a writer. Anything else? She's ever. Uh, <laughs> her work has been showcased uh, in festivals around the world. And her unique style and approach undoubtedly sets her apart from the crowd. Sarah also has a long list of amazing collaborators. She is the co founder of the Shadowwood Collective. Sarah's collaboration with Iskwe on her song, Little Star, actually brought a 22 Juno win home for music video of the year. Sarah, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Um, epic background here. Look at this amazing, you brought all your friends. <laughs> Good, yeah. I figured since I live with these guys, I would share them with everyone that was watching tonight. So amazing. this is how it looks at all times, pretty much. <laughs> It looks like a magical house. Um, Iskwe, when was the last time you were in London? Oh, well, <laughs> funny you should ask. <laughs> it was just days ago, and I was in that house 
If you see the window to the left, I was sleeping in that bedroom. <laughs> Amazing. But yes, I was, li- I was actually in London just a few days ago. When was the last time you played a show here? Can you remember that? Dust yes, that? I can. I actually can remember that, Savannah. Um, I The last time I played a show there was in November of 2019 at Alien Hall. Beautiful backdrop. Yeah. It was beautiful. I love that venue. Let's just give a shout out to Aeolian Hall here. Yeah. It's uh, still open, right? Like it's not uh, one of these ones that has succumbed to the. Good. We'll we'll leave it there. It's still open. Great. I love that venue. Thank you for being there. Thank you for having me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Sarah, I will ask you this question in a similar manner. What's the last show or event you were a part of? Uh, I would probably say Mod Club with Isque in Toronto. And when was that? Uh, that would have been January this year, yeah. actually. 2020. 2020. Yeah. Can we just go back to like early 2020? It feels, I, I feel so far away. Like it was a whole other world in life. Um, but I actually do want to uh, talk about the Junos because that actually feels like a good moment for us, at least in my head, because the Junos happens every year in March. And uh, this year was kind of like the Junos was sort of the first big event to cancel. And then things just kind of trickled out from them from there. Um, So I'm curious um, for the Junos 2020, which were set to happen in Saskatoon. I'm curious, what was your plans? Were you en route? Were you planning to go? Did you have hotels booked? What happened? Where were you when you got the news that it was not happening? We'll start with this way. Well, I, (laughs) um, (laughs) yes, yes, everything was booked. Everything was ready to go. We were, in fact, it was the day that we were all flying out there and I think our flights were at like 11 in the morning and my manager called and she's like, don't get in the car. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, I hate to say it, but you need to unpack your bags. And I'm like, what do you mean? And yeah. And it was just like the, the, the lid came off and everything just sort of snowballed from there. But it was, it was a bit bonkers because we had a huge team heading down so we were a team of I think there was something like maybe 14 of us or something like that so that was a lot of you know flights to try and get reimbursed I'm now sitting on a very substantial flight credit hey anybody want to go on a trip and you know like all of the hotels everything it was it was a a, you know I I'm still stammering on the words of it because it was very bizarre yeah so you didn't even make it No, we didn't make it. Sarah, you didn't make it, did you? You hadn't left yet. No, I actually woke up to uh, a message from you saying, unpack everything. (laughs) Oh, God. Then I I was supposed to do a radio show that morning, and uh, (laughs) I messaged them. I'm like, do you still want to do the show? (laughs) Because it was supposed to be about the Junos. So we ended up doing it anyway and just kind of gracefully didn't talk about it canceling. So Right. Yeah, because it took them a while to announce it. Like we were, we found out, they let us know. I mean, they let others know. We weren't the only ones they let know. But uh, what I mean is that um, we were given information about it being canceled before they publicly canceled it because they knew so many people were about to jump on planes. There were still lots of people who had actually made it down there in advance. Yeah. Uh, we were not, we were not of that bunch. Well, I think it's important to note too that the Junos isn't just one, you know, thing you see on TV. So we did host the Junos in London, um, actually the last year. Um, Mm -hmm. and it is a week of, of things. It's like, it's a whole production. There's tons of people that come into the community that for days and, you know, weeks in advance too. So yeah, I had friends that were already there and production people that were like, okay, "Okay, we're not having the Junos. So it was a wild. And they, they tried, they tried to adjust it several times before they finally pulled the plug. Like they, they had um, backup plans in place and you know, it started off that it would be um, 
because I was set to play the broadcast. So, you know, the, it, how they were going to present the broadcast was starting to shift. And that's when I was like, Hmm, something's, something's fishy here. When all of, all of those pieces were changing on that, you know, on the hour kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It really does feel like the Junos, at least in Canada, if you work in culture, that moment was a bit of a timestamp for a lot of us. Cause it was a lot of, uh, it, for a lot of people, it was like the last gig that they worked or the last gig they played or whatever the case may be. It was like that last moment, which mm -hmm. is weird to think about. Mm -hmm. um, so then we fast forward and they announced the actual winners. They didn't announce the actual, actual winners until June. Is that right? I That's couldn't. Right. Yeah. End of June. Pardon? It was the end of June. The end of June. So what was that like? So all of a sudden, you know, we've waited all these time, all this time. Normally you would have found out right away if you won, you know, within that week span. Um, so Sarah, obviously you uh, had a, had a bit of a, a screening at your place. Talk about that a little bit. Uh, well, we had these great gala dresses that we didn't want to waste. So um, we set up a projector on my front lawn and uh, it was kind of fun because we were able to include uh, more people that worked on the video as well. Everyone was spaced apart, wearing masks or social distanced, um, and nobody really knew what to expect. We just wanted to be there together to experience it. And um, I feel like when, and then I called this way beforehand and we had a little talk before, um, just kind of, you know, talking back and forth about what was gonna happen for the night because she was also performing that night as well. Um, it was, it was a shock. Like I remember the moment of when they actually said it, I was sitting down and um, there was another person nominated with the name Sarah as well. So when they said Sarah, I was like, whoa, which way is this gonna go? <laughs> and then they said it and then it, it was just a very odd, surreal experience, especially like being on my front lawn. And I'm right. just like looking around, like nobody knows what just happened in my neighborhood right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> but it was great. Um, and, and then did you guys get on the phone? Like what happened? Oh, uh, my phone actually I died. Reach, I couldn't reach her. I was like, I was calling and calling and texting and screaming. And I had to like send it on Instagram. I was like, ah, Sarah, I like, couldn't get through. Every time I looked at my phone, it said, you have a hundred new notifications. I was like, oh my, sorry, he's going through the roof. <laughs> my phone actually died from the amount of notifications I got. <laughs> I had to replace it. Seems like an amazing um, reason to have your phone, you know, blow up and die. You're like, I just want a judo. Blew up. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Uh -huh. uh, congratulations. I mean, it's a, it's amazing. It's an amazing thing. Um, do you have a physical Juno now? Did they ship one in the mail to you? How does that work? It's, uh, it's do over it. there. I could go grab it if you want to see it. <laughs> go get it. Okay. Yeah, let's see it. Let's see it. All right. I'll try not to knock anything over here. Are they, they're heavy. I, they look heavy. No? Sorry. Yes, they are. My neighbor upstairs has just come home, so my dog's barking, so I muted myself, just hoping that would help. Sarah, hurry up. <laughs> there so this, it is. This is it. <laughs> that is so amazing. It's pretty cool. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's nice seeing it every day because, you know, it's a reminder of of what happened, and who knows if you'll ever get another one again. So it's, it's just a real thing to look at. Amazing. I, um, how did the two of you meet? Let's go back to the beginning. We've, ah. we've talked, you know, now, how do we, how do we, uh, how, how did the two of you and connect? Um, so what happened was, uh, I did a project with Billy Talent, um, back in 2017. Um, Isco ended up seeing the video and ended up contacting me through social media. Um, I saw she was performing at Electric Eclectics, which was one of my favorite music festivals. And I was in Hamilton with a broken foot that summer and she was performing at the studio that I was hanging out at that summer as well. So it was a cotton factory. So mm -hmm. I kind of snuck in and approached her afterwards and said, you sent me a message. <laughs> that is amazing. The universe, the universe. If I it was nice. It was very serendipitous. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right, because when I first reached out, um, number one, I wasn't anticipating that she was 
local and I at all and then I definitely didn't anticipate her just like popping up into my life <laughs> right like I I was just like oh my gosh your work is incredible I think that was also like the the premise of why I hit you up was because I thought what you were doing was so outstanding that it was like yes I would love to work with you but it was also deeply rooted in the I just want to let you know how much I enjoy what what it is that you do yeah and I didn't so want to work with me no, no, but so I saw you perform for the first time and I found it really moving. Like I actually, it was the first time I've been at a concert and actually cried before. And I was like sitting there by myself and I was like, I don't know what I'm experiencing right now. Um, and she was talking about a lot of topics that I wasn't aware of. And, you know, I ended up going home and researching some of them, which ended up being uh, incorporated into the project because she was telling the stories about Tina Fontaine. Um, yeah. I, I, what was the first thing, Isque, that drew you to Sarah's work? Obviously it is amazing, but was there something in particular that stood out to you? Yes, the, so the, the Billy Talent video was this really dark, wild, like wildly dark, but still, um, maybe dark's the wrong word, spooky <laughs> stop motion video that reminded me of Tool, actually. And when I saw it, I was like, oh, th this aesthetic is, you know, it's something that I, I really love the, the other world, right? So this space that Sarah creates in, I don't know if it's what happens behind your eyes all the time, but she, she creates this other world that is so spooky and so beautiful and that's what really drew me in was that this this video it had this ele this tool element that i when i first saw it i was that's what i was drawn to but then it it possessed more of a there was a richer narrative you know i i looked at the details of all of the the little mice and all of the the wood on the floor and the art on the walls and like every little tiny piece. I was like, oh my God, this like the the level of detail doesn't end. And it was magical and and yeah, it it was just something that um when I looked at it, when I watched it, I would I felt like I I just felt it in my being. And I felt really connected to it, which is the other thing. I think that's one of the things from my end that has really drawn me to work with Sarah again and again is this, you know, this wh where where she can go, but also what she can see and pull from what I envision and how our two worlds, both of our other worlds fit so well. And so it was just like, you know, gravitational pull where I'm like, I have to meet her. <laughs> Sarah, how does it feel to have somebody say those things about your work, that it resonates that deeply with them? How does that feel? Oh, I think it's amazing because I feel like it's a mutual feeling. And so it, it really, when we sit together in a room, uh, we'll stay up for, for hours and hours to the point where she's like, Sarah, I have to go to bed. I have to go to bed. <laughs> I'm, like, to do this tomorrow. I'm like, but I have another idea. <laughs> like, we should... So as as far as like a collaboration partner, like it's it's really inspiring. It's fun. She really gives me a lot of freedom. But I also like to listen to the stories that she tells, so I can incorporate the stories from the visuals. Um, I just feel like we're able to understand each other well when it comes to the visions that we have for the projects we've worked on. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could maybe share a little peek into some of that creative process between the two of you, because obviously you have a great energy, and I'm curious what that looks like. Um, you know, you often hear about this in, you know, bands like, you know, the lead singer maybe shows up and he, you know, he's written the music and then the drummer adds the pieces. H how does it work for the two of you when you work together? What's that process look like? It has a, I think it has, a, it's had, I should say, different forms depending on the project. So with Little Star, um, this was before we really spent, like the, the majority of of this video was done over the phone or over email, like the, the back and forth between Sarah and myself. And while, while Sarah and I would talk about the 
sentiment of the song and sort of the vision I had for the, um, yeah, like the 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 storyline itself, like what the what the because this song is. Uh, let me preface this by saying this song is yes, it's about social activism, but it's also a cultural story as well. It's a story of the star people and it's a story of recognizing this teaching that I grew up with of venturing back into the sky to be with the ancestors when you're done on the walk like when your time's done on the walk in the walking world and so there were these pieces that I was expressing to Sarah but you know the the manifestation that you see in this in this piece that's the vision that she pulled from me talking about these these different tales and you know so so with that video it's like the um that the the brilliance of that really rests in her mind and that's been something that i i really admire um and then i i one of the other and then what was the question <laughs> and um, then what else was i supposed I to how we work together yeah like just the process yeah what you're answering yeah yeah. And then the, some of the other things that we do is like, I'll show up in London and we'll camp out in Sarah's house for a weekend. And we'll look at I some, you know, like as an example, the, a project that we're working on right now, I put together a mood board on Pinterest of in of different images that I am inspired by that I while while writing music, put these images together. Because they make sense to the you know, like what I'm feeling and, and seeing and hearing as I'm creating these songs. And then I bring that package to Sarah. And then from that, you know, she just takes her creative magic wand and is like, poof. And now we have a, another brilliant idea that is going to be a cohesive thing or bob when it's done. <laughs> yeah, I've, Sarah's work is so, your work is so, um, it's thought provoking and it's reflective and it's complex. And I was looking at, um, I'm a big fan of uh, like creatures and that's the kind of stuff I'm really drawn to. So I was looking at some of your little creatures earlier today. They all tell such deep stories, um, whether it's in your, through your illustrations or whether it's um, through your, um, your art dolls. And then you've got these intense, heavy themes that Isque is also speaking of and telling. And so it, I guess what I'm trying to say, it's this isn't really even a question. It's more just an observation that the two of you coming together is so, is so special because you're able to find this place to tell these stories that are so complex and there's just so much going on. It's, it's very reflective art, if that makes sense. Like, I just really feel mm -hmm. like you have to really take a moment to, to sit back and watch it a couple times. I found with Little Star, particularly. It, but. it becomes a challenge a little bit because you, when you're working on serious topics like that and you have three and a half minutes to tell the story and you have to tell a story where there's a climax and you have to tell a story where there's some kind of resolution in the end. And that's the challenge um, that I really like when I'm working on these projects. Uh, so that's why I love throwing as much symbolism everywhere that I can and talking with this way to learn more about her culture and the stories behind the star people and why it was important for us to make the main characters turn into stars at the end was to give some kind of peace to a tragic story that happened in the long run. And then the beginning where you have um, the characters that represent Tina and the characters that represent Colton, all the colors were chosen to represent the medicine wheel throughout the, all the scenes that they were in at the beginning. So just lots of little things like that. Uh, even in the forest, um, there's like Globe and Mail logos that are hidden, pointing at Tina when she's standing up, um, and stuff like that is kind of running throughout the whole video. One of the things that's been coming up in community a lot in sort of the arts and culture sector, and I, I'm wondering <clears throat> if you, or how you approach this, Sarah, is obviously um, you are not Indigenous and you are working with an Indigenous artist. And these are themes and things that, you know, um, these are stories and themes that are being shared with you. I'm curious how, or if it even, um, if it changed your approach or um, I guess I'm not, I'm not sure how to, how to put this, like, does it, how did you, how do you feel as a non-Indigenous person trying to tell these stories? Obviously you have, you're incorporated in it, but did you have to navigate any of those emotions for yourself? 
Yeah, like it's definitely something we thought about a lot. And um, the team I had working with me was very diverse as well. A uh, co-op student of mine was from an indigenous, indigenous background as well. And her mother, grandmother was in uh, residential schools. So that was something that she was fighting uh, a lot with herself in that time. Um, so bringing her on board to work on the project, uh, she said was a very healing project for her. And she learned a lot about her culture that she wasn't aware of and the stories of the Star people. Um, and her boyfriend actually bought her um, a star named it after her grandmother years before. So that meaning afterwards was like very, very emotional for her. And being able to um, see what she went through when I was working with her on one-on-one -on -one, was really touching for me and we have built a really good relationship afterwards um, and there was other people from different ethnicities that came from backgrounds where you would they would deal with racism and so it was really important for these people to be included in the project which is why another reason we wanted to make the characters very diverse as well and we spent like days and days trying to figure out like how we were going to build the characters um, you know, how they were going to dress and what kind of religions we can incorporate to uh, to this whole project. Um, so there was a lot of thought that went into everything. Uh, six months worth of work. I, I think we, it took us six months. Mm -hmm. But I would bring people to the house and be like, do you think this is okay? Like, um, we wanted to be as sensitive as possible and I did go to the library in London and we looked up every single article from uh, related to the trials for Tina and Colton and that was really difficult. There was a lot of crying <laughs> when it came to uh, making the buildings and putting the articles on the buildings. I found that actually really difficult to be able to stare at that every day while we were working. Felt really good tearing them down when we did that scene at the end. And yeah, I just feel like this project was definitely different from any project I've worked on just because of the content. And then, you know, you fall into a rabbit hole of all these other issues that you didn't realize that was going on. So it was a very heavy educational experience for me. Um, and, you know, I, I don't feel like I did a lot, but I just feel like if I'm able to help somebody tell these stories that are important that uh, are worth mentioning, I think, you know, if other people could be educated and just be aware of, incidences that are happening as well, then I'm, I'm definitely happy to, to help out. Iskwe, what, what was your first reaction when you uh, got the Dropbox file? I'm assuming it was Dropbox, I don't know, maybe you sent it via WeTransfer, but when you, when you finally saw the video for the first time, what was your initial first reaction? You know that emoji where it's the round face and it just has faucets pouring out of its eyeballs? That was this guy. I, I I was actually at the studio. We were mixing that song. So it was myself, the producer and the mix engineer. And we were sitting in the studio and we had been there already for like a couple of days because it was a big tune. So we were spending a lot of time um, on the mix, you know, like fine, fine tooth combing, fine comb yeah. toothing, fine, yeah. whatever that saying is. We were doing that and um, yeah, it came through. So the three of us sat there and watched it and all three of us were like crying like that emoji. And by the end, at the end of the video, we just sort of sat there and all of, nobody moved. We just sat there and stared at the, the blank computer screen and couldn't say anything, couldn't, you know, like it, it was, but it wasn't like, it wasn't a, it sounds heavy and it's heavy, but it was, it was actually quite cathartic to see and to, to, you know, because we were so immersed in the song still. And that song actually had quite a life of its own. Like the process to get the music to where it, you know, to, to the tune that you hear on the album and in that video, it was, it, it saw a bunch of faces. There were loads of people that, um, that worked on it with me and it kind of went down a few different directions and we finally got it back to the space. So it was like, you know, it, it was my baby. And then to see this baby be treated with such care, I, I was just like, oh, my heart 
my heart felt so good, even though it was such, such a, a piece of um, coming from such anxiety and angst and, and so on. It still left me feeling like, okay, at the end of the day, I'm so proud of this piece of art that we can provide people that will give folks an opportunity to be a part of beautiful art, be a part of um, strong messaging, be a part of um, cultural relevance, be a part of, you know, um, societal awareness, all kinds of things. And I felt so good about that. Healing is a great word um, mm -hmm. that I'm hearing sort of theme wise through this, that it really is um, a, a piece that represents healing. Yeah. Um, stop motion animation is so hard. <laughs> I, I, I really want to talk about <laughs> this because I recently just watched Nightmare Before Christmas with my three-year-old, mm -hmm. which he was very obsessed with. And I'm, I'm anyways, my, it's insane how much work goes into this. I can't imagine a two hour long film. You just said it took six months to do, you know, this video is what, three minutes, 50 seconds. Um, Sarah, talk to us about this process. Uh, so we had a team of 11 people helping. Um, everything was like, hand, everything was hand built. Even the buildings were individually bricked by hand and, um, there's 41 characters in total. And that was the challenge for us. Like, so once again, Iskwe and I, when we get talking and we get excited about projects that we're like, let's do an army of children. We're like, let's do like 40 kids. And then afterwards I was like, oh man, I don't know if that was a good idea. <laughs> never had 41 characters at the same time. And then not just 41 characters, but then the buildings all kind of collapsing around it. So uh, it was like one of those things where, I'm glad I did it. I don't know how many times you'd want to do a video <laughs> with that many characters, but uh, I was just like envisioning like what happens if they all domino down. So we started troubleshooting. So we built the whole uh, street out of metal and then we put like a, a canvas sheet over top and all the characters have magnets in their feet. So that's how they were able to stand without toppling over on each other. So just kind of like making things up as we go along, but also utilizing some old techniques as well. And um, every, I find the whole process is always a learning process for every project that we do. So even when we were, got to the scene where the, sh the paper was tearing down, we didn't know if it was gonna work. It was like one of those things where uh, we had one, one shot to do it and we were I was pretty sure it was gonna work. Other people on the team were not sure if it was gonna work. Um, but I think when you just do these projects after a long time, you kind of know how like, you can manipulate materials and um, you just you just kind of get a knack for what it's able to do. Um, I've been working with the arts project for a while too, doing stop motion with grade six to grade eights for the last few years uh, through the school boards and seeing how inventive the kids are. They'll be like, let's make things explode. And we'll do like this crazy yeah. cheese and the guy will jump off a cliff. And I'm like, I don't know how we're gonna do this, but yeah, sure, <laughs> we'll figure it out. And they always, always do it. So. For me, I loved being uh, around um, kids that were getting involved in this because, um, it, well, their ideas are just so out of the box. And, and for me, I, you know, I like to incorporate the out of the box uh, vibe for when we're working on projects like this. So, uh, with the kids, um, did you do you do like actual full three D um, stop motion? Because I've done it with kids where you do the two D style with the paper or like an object you know you know that version yeah you like some, some have done it that way but the majority of it so basically they would work with the arts project for a week they would build their sets and their backgrounds and they would come up with the storyline and then uh we would kind of rotate through the groups and help them animate them from beginning to end so i look at their storyboard and we have like uh, there's usually about eight kids in the group so we make one a director the other one's a camera guy and you just help the shy person, you give them the, the camera stick so they could press the button. And, um, you know, the ones that don't like to, the ones that act out a little bit, you make them director and then now they're focused because they like the idea of being able to tell people what to do. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
and and yeah i found that the kids were always like really great with it and uh we had like piles of all these finished videos that we would showcase at the end and they would bring them home to their parents and it was just always a lot of fun we uh sort of off topic but what at rock camp girls rock camp which i'm a part of we um did stop motion but we just did the 2d style and yeah, like the, the creativity that comes out of these kids, it's just, it's, well, it's the best. It's the best. Kids are the best. Um, but yeah, it's really funny to see where their minds go. And you're like, you're so, you wrote a one minute song. We're trying to make a, and even to, even to get to one minute of content is really hard. And so we end up just like looping it. Right. But anyways, it's yeah. Stop motion is amazing. Do you have a couple of favorite characters? I mean, they're kind of far away. Maybe you could show us one that you really like or both of you, Isquai, Sarah, do you have faves? I really like the main characters a lot, but gosh, it's amazing. And so are you sewing all these costumes and everything too? Oh, so uh, not for this project. This project, um, uh, my friend, Nydia Martinez, she works at Fanshawe College in the fashion design program. Um, she was leading that part. Uh, I worked with her on the um, two main characters just for designing, but um, it was her and two graduates from Fanshawe that ended up doing all the clothes. Wow. Yeah, my, my head is just blown by all the intricacies and the details and it's a very- a little goth one? Where's the one with the mohawk? She's at the end. Oh gosh, this one is so darling. Everyone says it's me. It's you. I just say haircut I did want when I was a teenager, so. That is great. Oh gosh, mm. so good. And so then, so, so you had the Fanshawe students doing the, the costumes and then were you doing the, um, like who drew the faces? Like, sorry, I'm asking so many technical oh, questions. Okay. I'm just so uh, no, I sculpted the faces. You sculpted um, all the faces. Yeah. <laughs> and then I had um, my fashion assistant, Melissa Pant. She was making the hands and she was gluing the hair on and I would cut the hair. It was like always like an assembly line when everyone was working together, so. Next time you do this, I want you to know that I'm your girl. I will mm -hmm. I will cut, I will sew whatever you want. Hey, that's, a, that's handy. I'm always looking for people. <laughs> <laughs> Find me up. Um, where do you, where would you say, Sarah, that you pull a lot of your inspiration from? You've been, you know, your work is so, uh, unique and stand out. I mean, I've known you in our community for a long time, so I'm very familiar with your work and I can always tell if it's a Sarah Lego, but what, um, what, what do you find inspires you the most to, to pull some of these characters and just the work in general? Uh, so when I was growing up, you were mentioning Tim Burton earlier. Um, I was a big fan of his stop motion. And then I got into the Quay Brothers, which really blew my mind because uh, they would have like screws that would be stop motioning and sawdust and just like really weird things that you wouldn't see other people do. Uh, Jan Sprinkmeyer was another one. And then we went to New York one year to see the Quay Brothers exhibit at the MoMA. And I was always really um, nervous about the idea of doing a project like this because I just assumed the sets were enormous and the set was enormous, but normally the projects I work on are quite smaller. Um, so when I saw that, that they're built in forced perspective and the characters just have to look good on the side of the camera spacing, um, you know, I would see like balls of tape and hot glue and popsicle sticks on the other side, which I didn't expect to see. Uh, I decided to go home and we built our first uh, forced perspective stop motion set for a pro uh, film I did called Dear Love. And uh, it was a musician, an artist in Berlin named Danielle DiPicciotto that uh, we were doing music video projects, but I was doing like 2D animation with her and I would illustrate, or she would illustrate and I would animate her illustrations and we did a couple of music videos this way. So she was organizing this art show in Berlin, asked me to take part and I was like, what do you think of the idea that I just try and stop motion animation when I've never done it before? And she said, sure, try it. And so I, I, I did and then I just never stopped once I got home. Well, you've been on a roll, kid. You're doing good. <laughs> um, COVID is strange. 2020 is weird. And um, it is, you know, for some people, it's been really emotional. And I think for some people, it's been really busy. And I think 
everyone's obviously like going through these emotions, but for the two of you in your practices, I'm wondering um, if we can find the most positive that's come out of this time. Isque, what's the most positive thing that you could say has been of 2020? I, for me, like for me as an individual or the whole sort of like what 2020 offers the world? Let's say you as an individual, but then maybe let's say also you as a person working in the music industry. Ah, okay. Um, I think both are probably the same answer, actually. For me, I was so burnt out. I was exhausted. I was um, suffering from severe depression. I... Yeah, I was like a shell of a person and I didn't even really realize. Um, I mean, I knew like I, I had been formally diagnosed and I, I had, you know, very strange reactions um, that weren't, that weren't, that didn't match my spirit. And so for me, when everything shut down, my initial reaction was like disbelief and sort of, I went into the, the land of, you know, I've got to find a way to stay busy and, you know, do all the things and whatever. And then I, then one day I woke up and I was like, no, I am going to rest now. And I just sort of stopped. And it was, I think it saved my life, to be honest. I think that it, it, you know, I, because I was lucky enough to find myself in a position where I had food on my plate and a roof over my head and I was living in a safe environment in that sense, I was able to focus on just resting. And I, I swear I did that for like six months straight where I just did not compete with anything. I did not allow my mind to pressure myself into any source of output that felt, you know, like I was doing it just to keep up. I just allowed myself that opportunity to rest. And I've never, you know, um, I've never allowed myself that opportunity. I, I am definitely not somebody that sits still for very long. And I'm definitely not somebody who um, puts work aside. <laughs> so, yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's good to rest. Sarah, what, what, what's what been the most positive for you? Um, I would actually say a similar answer. I remember talking to Iskoy at one point and I think there was a lot of pressure on artists and musicians at that time because I, I saw people posting being like, artists are gonna create incredible work during this dark time. And After the plague comes the renaissance. Yeah, yeah. I, and I remember talking to Iskoy and I was like, so like what creative things are you doing right now? And she's like, I'm tired, like I'm taking a break. <laughs> and I was like, wow, like it was so good to actually hear someone else say that because I, I felt the same way and I noticed there was other artists that I was and musicians that I was talking to that said that they were going through the same situation they were having this block and I actually spent most of my time outside gardening I built a greenhouse I raised my flower beds my vegetable beds extended the gardens out and like I just had so much fun just being outside doing that so I was and yeah. I had time to date again which I haven't in a while shout out to John who's watching <laughs> Yes. Kissing in COVID. All right. <laughs> good. Good. It's good to take these moments. Yeah, there's been a bit of a sort of natural reset in the weirdness of it all. Um, what comes next is TBD, I think. I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, you sort of hinted at it a little bit because you did say you were in town recently, Isque. But I'm curious what the two of you are scheming together next. It sounds like there could be some things percolating. Can you share what's going on? No. Okay. <laughs> Simple. No. How's that? It's just a straight up no. Um, no, I, I have been working on a new album. There's nothing, I mean, like I can tell you that there is one in the works. And from that, there will be, you know, uh, visuals and stories that are in the works that Sarah and I will be working on together. But that's about it. It's it's a little too premature at the moment to to go into any other detail. It's it's I'm not just being, um, you know, that 
that artist that is like, you'll, you'll just have to wait. It's like, well, it's too premature. <laughs> I totally understand. Um, Sarah, what, I mean, Sarah, what are you, yeah, Sarah, what are you working on? Uh, what am I working on right now? Grant applications. <laughs> Lots of grant, grant applications. Yeah. Yeah. And just personal stuff on my own as well. So mm, yeah. Amazing. Well, we're looking forward to seeing this next uh, collaboration because I'm just loving this whole thing. You guys are amazing together. It will be a fun one. I will. I, I'll give you a little sneak. I guess <laughs> it is going to be really good. We're creating a, another world. I'm just going to ramble here. Keely, if you're watching this, don't worry. I'm not going to give it all away. Um, but we are we are starting to build another story. So the nice the thing about how how I envision my art that has been a big part of how and why Sarah and I have made such um, a strong collaborative team is that we, Sarah, forgive me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but this is my interpretation of it, is we both, we both work from other worlds. And our, our other worlds, like I said at the beginning, really fit nicely together. And they meet in a really, a really delicious spot. And so my last album, Achikosuk, was this, the world of this teaching of the star people and bringing people into, um, or offering people the opportunity to join me in this space where I am learning and navigating these stories, these teachings that I grew up with from when I was a kid, right? And, and it was deeply rooted in, in, that, in that narrative and, and then also in this you know, um, social awareness narrative as well. So now, and that became Achikosuk, which w resulted in the, the Little Star video, which resulted in the show that we put on at the Mod Club, which has also resulted in, in Sarah and I, um, heading down to Stanford University in the coming months to go. And because that the, the project was commissioned, so we will be bringing it there to build for their audiences using their teams and, and so on. And now moving forward, so I guess that's something that we're doing. That's a big one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, we are doing that. Um, but then as we move forward into the next project where, you know, Stanford is, a, it's a continuance of Achikosuk. Now that we're entering into this next project, we are developing a whole new world together again. So it's the, and this is the part where that, the, the juicy narrative of it is what I'll sort of leave for the future. Um, but just knowing that we have, have found each other again and are starting to build this next world. How many times do you think I use the word world? And that's it's a, yeah, like, it's seven times. <laughs> like seven. Is that what you said? I said 87 times and it was 87. Great. Oh, well, that's good. I'll take it. Yes. <laughs> um, I am watching our time and I want to ask the, th the three of you, the two of you, the same three questions. <laughs> Get my words out here. What are you listening to? What are you reading? What are you watching? Who wants to go first? I, I do. <laughs> okay, I am listening to my daily mix number one on Spotify. It's doing some really good stuff lately. It has a lot of Michael Kiwanuka, Lapsley. Um, who else is on there? There's some D'Angelo that keeps popping up that I'm not mad at. And there, there's a lot of really good things on that playlist. So thank you, Daily Mix number one. I am reading a book. I, I can see it on my ta bedside table. So I'm actually like getting the title. It's called Dirty Birds. Have you heard of this book? No. Of this book? It's, it's quite funny by Morgan Murphy. And it's a, a story about Milton, Ontario, not to be confused with the small town. Milton, Ontario is the character's name. And it's just like, it's ridiculously oh. funny. Yeah. And he moves to Montreal and he wants to be a poet like Leonard Cohen and Leonard Cohen's his favorite poet. And it's just like, it's, it's, it's gold. Um, and I am, if, if it wasn't clear by my attire, 
I am a big fan of Schitt's Creek and Moira Rose. <laughs> you are all welcome. Kat, there are not enough awards in this world for Catherine O'Hara. I'm sorry, no. I just, I can't go. She, can't she deserves it. every, everything. Like she just, who is this woman? And why can I, like, I would like to be her best friend. Uh, so if anybody, if anybody watching is Catherine O'Hara, I would like to be your best friend. We need to be BFFs. She also, because of Schitt's Creek, I've done a bit of a, not a deep dive, but she was in Beetlejuice. Like she was in Home Alone. Yeah. Like so many classic things from our childhood. We are like, oh, oh yeah. Catherine O'Hara, you're a dream. She's a dream. Sarah, what's on your docket these days with those three? Uh, it's funny because you were talking about Leonard Cohen poems. I'm actually reading a Leonard Cohen book, uh, poem book right now. Huh. Um, then also got into Tuba or Bust about Richard Feynman's last journey that he was doing before he got cancer, um, or the journey he was trying to do. But I'm not at the end yet, but I'm getting there. Uh, Schitt's Creek was something I was watching with this queen <laughs> over the last few years. This weekend. <laughs> yeah, and the Queen's Gambit was like another one that we were recently, I was recently watching. Uh, as far as music, I'm always listening to stuff on repeat and I, I listen to a wide range of stuff. Behind my computer on that other side is 300 black cylinders and lots of 78s and stuff like that. So I'm very much into, you know, early 1900s to listening to Can or lots of new wave or Nina Simone is one of my female, uh, favorite female singers. So it's always just random throughout the day. Amazing. Um, we're gonna go to this chat if I can do it correctly. Someone wrote, Linda wrote in the Q&A, hey, Sarah, when are you coming to Saskatoon? Your room is still available. Uh, so that's my aunt uh, and my uncle who I was supposed to stay with when the Junos were happening and they got everything ready. And, you know, I, I eat gluten-free. So they went all out with the gluten-free foods and, and they were on their way traveling on holidays. And I had to give them the news while they were at the airport. I'm so sorry we're actually not coming and I, I felt terrible. So we will end up coming at some point, I promise. <laughs> um, Richard has also asked, and he just wrote magnetic feet, question mark. Yeah. Uh, let's see if I can show a better example. Oh, you could kind of see it on this one. So we use earth magnets. Wow, cool. Yeah. Amazing. Regular magnets won't work. I'm also trying to navigate this chat because things are going in the chat too. Um, someone wrote, could you post the link for the mood board? That sounds interesting. Would like to see how it's done. Ooh, I create my mood boards on Pinterest actually. Um, so I won't post it. I mean, maybe that would be something later on, but um, so not right now, <laughs> um, but yeah, I do. What I end up doing is I go and I collect different images and stuff from around the interwebs and I put it all on Pinterest. And then sometimes I'll even divide it up. So the way I've done this mood board, you didn't ask this question, but since I'm saying no to showing it to you right now, I will explain kind of what it looks like. Um, I divide up, so I have the the main board, which is for the album, and then I divide it up by the song. Because the way I actually write music is I have to visualize how, how I would present the music, if that makes sense. So I really, I mean, I'm, I'm, I am a musician, yes, but I consider myself an artist, primarily um like you know if there's like a tier of of terms um because the way i the way i do create music is i have to see i start off by like or not start off i simultaneously hear and visualize everything so that as i'm making the music if i get stuck on something i actually try and figure out what it is that i'm trying to convey in imagery and that'll be both for video um any kind of visual aesthetics, stage performance, so on. So I go in and I make these different, you know, like mini mood boards per song. And then I'll often kind of um, 
record them so that it looks like a little mini mu music video. Amazing, sorry, I was, my brain was like, woo, so many things open at this time. Um, <laughs> somebody has a question for Isque. Uh, this is from Kaylin. Isque, it almost sounds as months long meditation to realign your emotions and re-energize. Do you see some new world coming from this process? Sorry, I meant the COVID time. Sorry for missing that detail. Do you see some new world coming from this process? Um, yeah, like I, I actually did this at the top of COVID when everything came to a crashing halt and my brain was trying to recover and, you know, figure my way out. A friend of mine offered me a 21 day meditation challenge and I'm not, you know, I am not one who's ever meditated before in my life. Um, I'm not one who's normally very good at sort of like those types of challenges but I for some reason was like you know what I think this will be good for me and so every day I sat with the different tasks of the day and one of the main things that I pulled from it was this teaching about the recognition of abundance being around us and um wanting for abundance in your life and what the various definitions of abundance in any given moment and in, and, and in any given day could be and how personal th those definitions will be. And so I, that was something that I really took, um, took with me from it. And it's, so yes, it's definitely COVID gave me that opportunity to find this element of calm and serenity, but it also gave me this moment to identify all of the things that I find incredible about my day-to-day -day life that I try to do um, like I try to remind myself of. I'll give you one quick example. My mother has this mantra that has been mine for eternity, and it is only good things come from forced change with the idea that if you really believe that good things come from, you know, um, any anything hard you push through and you, you persevere and there'll be something good on the other side, basically. Um, so when I'm walking down the street, you know, as an example, I might be, freezing cold because the temperature's changing and you know it's covid and so you know everything's shut and i'm looking and i'm seeing shutters closed and it's stressing me out and i'm feeling anxiety and whatnot and then i pause and i'm like ah oh, but you know i take the opportunity to breathe in and to recognize that um you know i'm here and this is this is the, the the feeling of abundance that i'm having in that exact moment is just recognizing the, the bringing it bringing it in as small as possible i don't know if i'm if i even answered that question i hope kaylin that I, that that was helpful we have another one here <clears throat> oh you just cut out can you still can you still hear us this way yeah oh there you are um okay here's another one um, for Isque, a follow-up to the earlier question, your advice to non-Indigenous creatives wanting to work on Indigenous subjects. From Lisa. My, say, my Your advice to non-Indigenous wanting to work on Indigenous... Ah, I would suggest that if you, if someone is non-Indigenous and they are interested in working on Indigenous subjects, that they ask themselves some pretty um, honest questions about what the what what the the motivation is, what the goals are of you know like for yourself in participating in that conversation or subject, and why why you're being drawn to it, what you feel you have to offer um, on any of those subjects or conversations, and then I would also suggest to reach out to people in the community um, to pass thoughts and ideas by before beginning, during, and before completing. Because I think the thing that, that ends up, ha or I think something that's really important about this idea of building the relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous and finding ways to work through creation and and build while doing so is that partnerships are really important and trust is really important right and you can't have 
solid partnerships without trust. And yeah, so that's this, to me, it's like, um, as an, ex as an example with Sarah, we, we worked very closely on a lot of the fine details of this project. Sarah was wonderful in asking loads of questions along the way. I didn't always know the answer. Sometimes I would revert to asking elders or asking other community members um, because I'm not, you know, like I'm an indigenous person, but I, I don't represent all indigenous people. I don't have all of the answers. And I think that that humility of being able to say like, I don't know everything is an important space to walk in. So to, to Lisa, to answer your question, I would say that it's, you know, all of the, aforementioned things and this idea of it's okay to be humble and and remind ourselves that as individuals we don't hold all of the tools and all of the information and so it's important to build trust and relationships with others in the process and if i could just throw something in there um also about um when we are asking bipoc folks for things and um what what again coming back to like what it is and understanding that there um, could be traumas or experiences that not everyone is wanting to relive or, or go down this path and what, and what, and it facts. Yeah. Anyways, we're having this conversation. I feel like I'm having this conversation a lot in my world. So I, yeah. Yeah. That's why I was saying about the asking yourself, yeah. why, like, why, why are you participating in this? What are you hoping to achieve? What are you hoping to offer? Because, a lot, you know, if it's a lot of self-serving things, then it's important to ask yourself, are you the right one to be doing this job? And maybe you are, maybe you have a lot that you can offer. But again, it comes down to, I, I feel like building relationships along the way, regardless, is an important tool to maintain. Absolutely. Okay. There is another window open here. Um, a question from Charles Vincent on Facebook. What have you been listening to? And then it says, wax cylinders. That was his quotation. <laughs> yes, Charles. Um, okay, what am I writing? What am I reading? Someone's saying, dance, dance to indigenous music, learn their histories because ghosts ain't gonna come tell you all. There you go, that's right. It's good to dance. Um, we have another question that says, what does this ring mean to you? And I would say, are you referencing Isque's big, beautiful ring? Is that the one you're, you're looking for there, anonymous friend? Do you guys remember um, He-Man and She-Ra? <laughs> By the power of Grace Skull. <laughs> Was that really loud? Sorry. Um, no, this is Caribou Antler and a wonderful artist named Amber Morningstar is the one who made me this ring. And I love it. It is my uh, source of strength. And, and I love it. It's gorgeous. Thank you. Amber Morningstar. Look her up. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have any um, questions for Sarah and Isque on the on the docket here? We've got a few ways that you can reach out to us. Um, people are loving the ring. Great. Thank you. We should love it. I'll just sit like this now. <laughs> well, I know that um, Isque has been on a, a major um, Zoom marathon today. Yeah. And so if everyone's <laughs> cool, um, we can wrap it up so we can all um, do our things in our own individual respective cozy homes. Um, if that works for everybody. Sandra De Silva's here. Hi, Hi Sandra. <laughs> Sandra runs the arts project in London ah. and Sandra's the best. And she wrote Sarah hugs. Mm. And so many virtual hugs are being given in 2020. It is right. It's the it's way of the future. It's weird because I didn't really like hugging people, I must admit, but now I miss it, you know? Mm. It's like, oh, I can't do it, so yeah. I missed out, you know? But someday soon, we will all be together. Um, okay, well, on that note, I just want to say thank you again to both Sarah and Isque for joining us. 
I want to say thank you to Words for having us. Um, I hope everyone had a great night and enjoy the rest of your Words Festival. Although I think this is sort of towards the end. Josh told me before we started that they've done 20 um, events like this. Whoa. Over the last two weeks. What, a, what an amazing feat. That is amazing. That's awesome. Congratulations. And yes, thank you to everybody for having us and for jo joining us and for all your questions and your thoughts and your love. It's, um, you know, it's nice that even in such weird, weird times, we can still connect in brand new ways. And I don't feel so disengaged or far away from everyone. So, Ekosani, thank you for having me. Thank you. Do I just hit exit, Josh? Is that how it works? We just all go away? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I just end the party. And, and goodbye. Thank you both. It was really nice to see you. Likewise. Have a good night, everyone. You too. Bye, guys.